there was no other logical reason in my brain about what was going to happen to me, then that's it. That was going to be my moment that I was going to be killed. Megan, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. It really means a lot. These last years, and especially these last few days after what you went through that fateful day in Victorville, and then the subsequent trial feels like almost a re-victimization of the attempted execution when you were just going out and responding to a call for service. How do you feel sitting here today? I feel a lot of things. I feel a sense of relief that that portion of my journey is closed. I also feel a portion of sadness and anger that that was the closure that I had been waiting almost four years for. It's a hard thing to accept when you've been waiting for something that you believe will happen and it's taken from you. But overall, I just feel heartbroken. We know your story, but I I just wanna hear it from you again. You get a call for service, it's an unknown problem, don't know what you're responding to. You go to work to do your job and boom, what are you met with in that moment? I respond, I'm maybe a few minutes down the road. So it came out as a priority one, I knew I needed to respond. So I went to the address and I parked a few houses down. And as soon as I get out of my unit and I start walking up the driveway to make contact, then the reporting party and the suspect come walking out of the door and we're met kind of in the middle, lower half of the driveway, and he beelines it straight towards me, and she's kind of standing off to the right, and she's still on the phone with 911 while she's holding a knife. I haven't gotten to hear all of your part of the story, but when I even hear that, I'm thinking, man, I think back to when I was on patrol. Immediately, you see somebody armed, you're going to think there's danger, right? Exactly. That was the first thing I thought is, I was able to conclude that she was the one calling for help and she was in such fear that she armed herself with a knife. I mean, if there's not a threat presented to you, why would you arm yourself? So I knew I needed to talk and figure out what was going on. And because he walked directly towards me, that's where our confrontation led. Either way, even there's there's a weapon at the scene. There could be other weapons at the scene, right? Exactly. So. I mean, we kind of are taught that one plus one, if she has one, he might have one, and it's up to me to make sure that he doesn't. Tell us how you were feeling in those moments. Initially, I felt like I may be dealing with somebody that just is not happy I'm there. Maybe they're going through a hard time. Maybe it's just bad timing, Right. We respond to the worst of people's days. I'm not there when you're having a good day. So I just thought maybe, you know, this guy's just upset. But let me just try and talk to him, figure out what's going on. So it quickly changed from let me figure out how I can help to I need help. Clearly it was, I think you said like 18 seconds or just so quick. Yeah. But what was he saying to you right before he got physical with you? As I'm trying to put his hand to the small of his back, he's resisting. He's pulling away, pulling away. So I'm telling him, relax, relax. What's going on? You're okay, relax. And he tells me, I'm going to headbutt the out of you. So I immediately am like, okay, well, we're kind of on different pages then. So I step kind of offline, and that's when he turns around and grabs my wrist. And he tells me, if we fight, I'll kill you. He just immediately grabs hold of my wrist. I'm telling him, let go of me, let go of me. He's, I'm trying to pull out of him, and he's refusing. I mean, to the point where he broke the bottom of my thumb from pulling so hard. And then I, you know, go to my RCB. He grabs that, rips it, throws it out onto the gravel, and then just starts assaulting me. There was one point in your story where you said, and it just it st- stood out to me because, you know, you said he mounted me, like he got on top of you and he was just, at that point, what was happening? When the video kicks on, we're kind of in the street and he's punching me in the face and we end up moving into the gravel. And I can't tell you if it was because I lost consciousness, lost my footing, lost my bearing. I don't know how we ended up on my back, but I was laying down on my back and he was on top of me, mounting me. 
and I have my gun out and I take fire at his head because I knew I had lost that fight. Right. I knew there was no other option anymore. My life was in danger. Yeah. After I, you know, fire, then he ends up pinning my arm above my head in the ground and he gets his finger in the trigger with mine and we discharge around. I say we, cause that's like so odd. The gun. Well, you, you both yeah. have your fingers on the trigger, right? Yeah. So he has one hand in the trigger and one hand like wrapped around the slide. So when the gun goes off in the ground, it malfunctions and then he's able to rip it out of my hands. When he has your gun and you, you see him pointing it at you, tell me, tell me what's going through your mind at that moment. Guilt. I felt a lot of guilt that day. My daughter had just started kindergarten that year. And I woke up and I made her lunch and I dropped her off at school. And I never tell her goodbye. It's always, I'll see you after school. And everything happened so slow-mo. It's like so condensed and so everything else just kind of goes quiet. And so I turn and I'm on my hands and knees and I look up and I'm looking down the barrel of my gun. And I hear the trigger click. And I had so much pain to my face. And I had, there was no other logical reason in my brain about what was going to happen to me, then that's it. That was going to be my moment that I was going to be killed. And for what? I still didn't even know why the mom needed help. I yeah. still didn't even know why I was there. Looking back now, I know that a malfunction saved my life. And although in the academy and, you know, in training, they never want malfunctions, right? Like you never want your gun to malfunction. Right. It's the right. worst. That just gave me chills. Yeah. But that saved my life. Right. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. I would have been shot and killed. For what? All of those emotions were going through my head in those couple of seconds. I felt so bad for my daughter. Who was going to take care of her? Who is going to be there for her if I'm dead? And when I heard the trigger click and survival instincts kicked in, my will to survive was like, no. I'm obviously still, my legs are moving. My heart is beating like we got to get out of here. Yeah. So I turn and I run away and I just start running. And I find a little bush. So I hide behind the bush and as I'm running... I hear another gunshot go off and I knew he's firing at me as I'm running. And I still didn't really understand how I hadn't been shot. So this whole time I'm thinking I had been shot. Right. Then my partners show up. I remember trying to press my lapel saying, he has my gun. He has my gun. Trying to tell my partners because I wanted them to know he's armed. Right. And this whole time I'm not really understanding what really happened. It's like an out of body my adrenaline kind of, I think, shut off my logical brain, and I was just in survival mode. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to people who say, you shouldn't have done this, or you should have done that, or why didn't you do this? Not just from the public, maybe even people from our own profession. You know, having a voice is strong, so I just want to give you that opportunity to respond. I think it's really easy to look at things in hindsight. I think it's really easy to see a minute or so video and say, why didn't you do this? What about that? I would have done this. But in that moment, it was split seconds where we were quickly going down a bad path. So I knew it wasn't just about figuring out if something happened to his mom. It was me and you are fighting. Yeah. Me and you are, this is us now. Yes. In hindsight, sure, there's other things I could have done. But in that moment, in those seconds where I'm having to flip on survival mode, I did what I could do with what I had. I did with the best of intentions in good faith to try and be a deputy that day. Right. 
That was all I wanted to do was just do my job. And that was taken. It's hard for me to think this was four years ago or almost four years ago. Yeah. Um, but here we are. You had been in trial for the last few weeks regarding this. You're the victim in this case. And there's all these counts. And I don't want to get into like the specificities of the charges or anything like that. But there's several counts against the suspect. You know, attempted murder and assault and, you know, all of that stuff. And here we are today with a verdict of not guilty on really those major counts. How do you feel about that? The best way I can describe it is when I was laying in the hospital and they're like, you weren't shot, you weren't shot, you weren't shot. How was I not? And now I'm sitting here like, wait, these people are saying that this didn't happen. So what happened? Right. Because why have I spent the last four years healing from this when he's walking from this? So I feel like I'm just in that space of what even happened to me? This How, incredulousness, right? Right. And so it's it's shifted from the physical healing and the mental healing to just, and I, I'm at a loss for words because I don't think that I can find a statement to say that would properly describe how I feel. Yeah. I'm just sad. Talk to me about being having a voice right now. How does that feel for you? I don't want to say it feels good because nobody ever feels good to be on the other side of the justice system. Nobody ever feels good to be a victim. But the outreach and the support I have gotten from the law enforcement community and just the community that back me and support me and they support what we are doing is enough for me to say, okay, tomorrow you will wake up and keep fighting. And there was some dark days where I didn't have that. There were some times throughout the last four years where I didn't know what tomorrow was going to mean. And now I have a new drive to give the silent voices a voice. And if I have to be that beacon because of something horrible that happened to me, it would be a shame if I didn't use this second chance for good. I know somewhere in the country right now, another cop is being hit in the face. Another victim is going to have a gun pointed at them. Something else will happen. And for me to sit idly by and just accept this would be a travesty. And I just can't. We just have to get everybody to at least agree that law is law, right is right, wrong is wrong. And we just need to get back to that place. Again, I don't want to ask the hard questions to put you in the hot seat, but I want to I want you to be able to address things that have been said. My understanding is in your trial, race was played as an issue against you or you were painted out to be somebody you're not. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to that. Unfortunately, it was. And unfortunately, that has become kind of an emotion that people have brought in. For me that day, nothing played a factor in anything other than I was on the other end of a radio trying to help someone. I had no idea who I was contacting. I had no idea what I was even responding to. I just did what I was supposed to do. Yeah. And the fact that that is being asked and the fact that that is being presented is heartbreaking because I didn't provoke any of this. It was the suspect's actions that dictated what happened to me. Well, and to be painted out as you know, a bigot or a racist, that's not who you are. So how does that feel when those insults are being hurled at you? It's horrible. I don't understand how somebody can completely twist what happens to someone and make something else out of it. And so as I'm sitting there and all of these lies are just being hurled at me and I'm trying to defend myself on top of defending myself of what has happened to me, it's it's almost like an out-of-body experience because it's just so blatantly wrong. It's yeah. a lie. You know, we can't just go around pointing fingers at people and shoving something on someone that's not backed by proof or evidence. Any fact, it, any nothing. nothing. I understand the justice system plays a very important role in everybody's lives, but we also have to remember that the justice system is there for these reasons. 
you know, it's not about emotion or perception or beliefs. It's about something that has been here long before we were ever alive. It's up to us to keep that. You know, what about the next generation? What about our kids? We should be able to be analytical, have discussions, ask questions. Not everything has to be based on just emotion. And it seems like emotions are just winning the day with and completely taking over facts, evidence, common sense. That's exactly what happened in my case. It was the evidence was there. The video was there. The belt recording is there. There's nothing more that could have been presented that wasn't tangible. You can see it. You can hear it. And if that's not enough for people to have a different understanding of what happened, then I, I don't know. And that's terrifying that that is where we have become. That is what we have settled into just believing is okay. And I just refuse to accept it. It's not just about law enforcement. It's not just about our county. It's about victims. Right. At the end of the day, if that gun would have gone off, I would have been a human being that would have had a death certificate. I wouldn't have been just a uniform hanging up. It was a real life person that would have actually left this earth. Yeah. And so you take away all of the uniform and all of the, the minute things, right? I'm a human. I have a husband and I have a daughter and I have sons and I'm a, a sister and all the things, right? And the fact that because somebody didn't like what I was doing that day, they were going to end my life. We have to speak up for those victims because I know I'm not going to be the last. And I know that there's something that can be done. We just have to speak up about it. Well, you have a voice here. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.